Lifeline True, the show where we go into some of the mysteries, anomalies, and the dirty underbelly of the world around us. I'm your host, Paul, and joining us this week, we have Joaquin Flores, who is a uh, geopolitical analyst uh, currently based in Serbia, and uh, he has all kinds of good articles and information that you can find on the internet if you search for it. Joaquin, are you there? Hey, how's it going, Paul? Oh, fine, thanks. How you been? I've been pretty good, just uh, you know, weathering the storm. We got some bad weather here. We had a, a lot of crazy political things going on here, so it's uh, kind of one of those things where you gotta stay stay up to date and keep your fingers on the pulse. It can be hard to keep up with. Well, in your part of the world, it's probably easy to believe in this uh, blood moon, blue moon, shemitah, or whatever theory, right? Right. <laughs> a lot going Definitely. on in the Balkans, right? Tremendous. It's uh, definitely Actually, uh, a fire point. Well, why don't we uh, just jump straight in, uh, straight into that? That's uh, you know, southeastern Europe uh, is got a lot going on. What do you, what do you, what do you think? Where, uh, where you sit? What does it look like? From where I'm sitting, we have primarily a a government in Serbia, which whose decisions are going to determine. Uh, a lot of, of what happens um, with relationship to the U.S. and what, how they're able to, to do things with Europe and how things go with Russia. So it's, um, as has happened, you know, 100 years ago, um, Serbia is a, is a focal point um, in, in the global conflict. Strange as it would seem, population of 7.5 million people um, and yet it, it's, uh, it's a very, very big hitter, uh, in terms of, of the outcome of, of the events. Well, just for our listeners, what would you say some of the high level things going on are the, uh, the refugee crisis? The refugee crisis is very big. Um, one of the one of the big things that Serbia is going to face is the fact that they were, well, I guess you would say they, they were willfully scammed um, by Germany um, because uh, there was uh, at some level some understanding, of course, that Germany would, would not be taking all of the refugees. And, um, and yet Serbian government made an agreement with Germany, with the EU, with Brussels, that um, while it's not an EU country and it it's it doesn't uh, it's not part of any of the agreements, they made a side letter um, primarily on the issue of the return of refugees. So, long story short, if they're not accepted into Germany, they get returned to Serbia. If they're not accepted into Sweden or Finland or France, uh, they return to Serbia. If they pass through Serbia, well, I mean. Since when do Serbians trust Germans? Right, since never. Um, and so th that's just one issue, but it's all related, of course, and why Serbia would be a target, why this you know, half-compromised government would, would, ha would have to make that kind of agreement. Um, you know, th that relates to issues, of course, of, about the Serbian deep state or really uh, the lack of... Uh, the lack of a deep state, um, that's its primary weakness. It has an intelligence uh, organization that's infiltrated both by the Russians and the Americans. Um, and that's been the case uh, since the end of World War II. And it's, that's why Belgrade, that's why almost every James Bond movie has a scene taking place in Belgrade. Um, James Bond, actually, the author of the books based the James Bond character off of uh, a very one of the major influences of the character was a very famous Serbian spy um, uh, whose name escapes me. I'm not a James Bond uh, fanatic, but at any rate, that's that's the story as it goes. So Belgrade is a is a central focus in a lot of um, espionage and counter espionage intelligence, and it, it's a it's a big uh, access point for for a lot of activity. Hmm. Well, since you're in Belgrade, uh, what is the, I guess you'd say, the feeling in the air or the feeling on the street? There is a lot of tension. Um, we have an election coming up. 
I mean, so many things have happened here. I mean, so we, we mentioned the refugee crisis. People are aware of this. I mean, we've got, you know, four, five, six thousand refugees flooding into a country that's seven point five million people every day. And Serbia has been trying to get them into Hungary and Croatia. There was an issue last week with the border being closed um, temporarily. And there was a one day permanent. It was a permanent trade embargo that lasted for a day between Croatia and Serbia and reminded people of the war that just happened here not long ago in the scheme of things. Um, like I say, the wars that took place here, this is not, um, you know, grainy footage, uh, black and white, and you know, 1930s dictators and stuff. The wars that happened here uh, happened in the age of the Internet, uh, in the early, you know, dial-up days. There was already, you know, Netscape and, and AOL and, uh, and, you know, cable TV and, uh, you know, house music and techno clubs and, you know, motorcycles and rap. I mean, all that stuff was already happening in this part of the world, and there was a major war. Um, several hundred thousand people died. Um, it created over 900,000 internally displaced, quarter million ethnically cleansed. It was a horrific and brutal thing. There were decapitations, kidnappings, uh, sex trade, organ trade. A lot of that stuff still goes on in, in Albania. And, um, and so people here are not detached like the, uh, you know, boomer uh, post-World uh, War II generation in the West. They don't think that war is like some bad thing that happens in other places, right? So you have a population that gets it. They know it. And they know when it's in the air. And they know what the politicians say and, you know, what happens, in, in, what happens with the, the currency and things like that when things are heating up. And things are definitely heating up. They know what the rhetoric is like. So the other big things that have happened besides the refugees, you had Dr. Sheschel, who was a big figure during the, the Yugoslav Civil War, the Third Balkans War, finally released from The Hague, right? That's one major, major thing. The next, of course, is the, relation, is the Turkish Stream or South Stream project. How that's going to play out, are both of them done? Is one of them salvageable in some incarnation? Of course, the words are not as important as whether there will be a pipeline or not that goes to Serbia and whether Russia is part of that project, whatever, by any, by any, any project name. And then another thing is, of course, the um, Russian military base project in Serbia. Serbia never formally allowed a NATO base, but there is, of course, uh, U.S. military presence um, in the country in a limited extent. But the similar to, uh, on a, though on a smaller scale, similar to how in Baghdad there's like the embassy is actually a military base. The U.S. embassy in Belgrade is a giant complex that takes up an entire square block and is guarded with armed guards and it's you know has the look and feel of a military base. Um, and it's it's not like a consular office the way anyone else thinks of one or the way any other country has a consular office in Serbia. You've got, um, you know, major, major developments happening um, with the relationship with Montenegro, uh, with Macedonia, with Bulgaria. So now I implore people to look at a map. I know these are obscure sounding countries to some. But I, I promise you that this landmass we're talking about is equal in size to Western Europe. And it's right across the Adriatic from Italy, and it's right north of Greece. And it's where both major world wars, where uh, they either started or the major turning points or major conflicts occurred. Um, and uh, and it's, it's still a very, very, very hot spot. Well, so this uh, refugee thing, um, a question or two. One is, what percentage of them are actually from Syria as opposed to, you know, wherever, northern Africa or something? It looks like between half and two-thirds are Syrian. Okay. Um, uh, based upon who based upon a german an, a german uh, survey that was published 3 or 4 days ago from the time of this recording um that announced that one third of the refugees were not syrian so that would be the the floor i mean it could be two thirds are not syrian but the german government is publicly admitting 
that one third are not Syrian. If so, you know, um, there's already just tremendous evidence of forged documents, and and the EU and Serbia have been very laxed about um, uh, about documents. Um, as a, as a side note, some of the big protests among the refugees um, were very strange, and they had to do with documents, and um, and and it, and it and it really really showed an interesting thing about the lies that the EU puts out to the world. That these U.S.-backed NGOs um, that were in Libya and were in Syria actually had these populations convinced that in Western Europe that people don't need documents, that everything is free. And so that's why they thought that in Gaddafi's Libya that gave, you know, that gasoline was subsidized by the state and, you know, married couples got $60,000 and a free apartment and everyone that went to university went for free, all over Europe for free. I mean, basically it was a North African paradise. They had the highest... Um, uh, they had the highest uh, figure on the UN human development um, figures, and they had the second highest GDP in all of Africa. Um, if you exclude South Africa, which enjoys tremendous um, British and Dutch investment um, and is, of course, built upon the legacy of colonialism in South Africa, if you exclude them, of course, they were number one in Africa. And, of course, given how big Africa is, look at Libya. It was really, you know, the whole region um, including lots of, of, of sub-Saharan Africa, um, b bigger than Egypt, better than Egypt. And Libya was, was ginormous in terms of its, its ability to, to deliver for everyday people. And yet you had, you know, the Saracenians convinced that life could be better than that. And then you've got these Syrians protesting at, at the idea that things aren't free, that things are expensive. That um, that they have to show documents to get from one place to another, and and if you look at the propaganda, um, the anti-Assad propaganda from Syria, the U.S. backed the George Soros uh, NGOs, the NED-funded groups in Syria. You look at the pamphlets and the and the and the newspapers and things they were saying when they were attacking the Syrian government for people having to register to go to school. I mean, they, basically, they were anarchist uh, criticisms of the society, and they were saying that you, you basically need to have an anarchist society uh, for to you know to be one that would be free of criticism. So they get to Europe, and they're expecting, and it's, it's, it's I know it's hard to believe because you would think that people have relatives, or they're not retarded, or that they would have some sense of of the world. That, but you know, many people don't. Um, literacy is not tremendous in, in lots of these parts of the world, and the impact of the media is um, very high. And Western media had a tox toxic effect. And, um, and so we can see in Serbia, uh, you know, Serbia is a, is a country that, that, that in the Balkans has a, a per capita GDP of about um, uh, $2,400 a year, um, maybe Three thousand dollars a year, and um, the Syrians uh, here, um, for some reason, had tremendously much more money than the average Serbian uh, Syrians in quotation marks. Some began to buy up property. There's a lot of shopping. The five-star hotels were filled up. Um, so the question of refugees was very strange because um, certainly a lot of them were not impoverished and were staying for for weeks and weeks at places that cost several hundred euros a night. You know, did they come um, out of Turkey or how are they getting into Serbia? Yes, a lot of them had come out of Turkey, but there's the official there's the official starting point and there's the unofficial starting point. So you had you had um, refugees who had been in Turkey and Turkey began to try to push them out, right? And that was a very big element. But um, uh, people who who had money. Um, seem to have come from all over and buying are buying documents that you know, 900 bucks a pop, 2,000 bucks a pop um, for fake documents and then spending 200 euros a night in hotel rooms for three, four weeks. I mean, there was just a lot of like, where's this money coming from? Who are these people? 
um, some investigative journalists were able to connect a lot of people with money to um, the FSA, to the, to the anti-Assad coalition, um, the internal one. Um, now, in the popular, in the popular sort of pro-Syrian, pro-Assad um, discourse, that you know, they've emphasized the foreign invasion element of it, and they 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 they, they claim that it's not a civil war. Um, and and you know, in terms of uh, describing the the fullness and it's in and in the whole picture, yeah, it's not a civil war. That's a correct assessment. But in the details, of course, there were. A, a number of Syrians who supported the U.S. and supported the FSA, and they made a lot of money through war profiteering, and they made a lot of money recruiting guys to go in from other countries to fight, and they played the role of like local halfway house where people would stop, and there was a lot of businesses that, that benefited from that. Well, um, I guess a question in all this is, how much of uh, the um, unhappiness is real and how much of it is contrived? I, I think that um, a big argument that uh, radicalizes people like in Libya was that they thought they should be living as well as the people in Qatar. And so that's a, that's a problem. Right. The problem is that poor people in Qatar, in Qatar are, are somewhat poor and they also have, you know, Filipino migrant workers and all kinds of things. And, with the problem is about perception and marketing. Um, Libyans had the highest standard of living um, in all of Africa um, by the UN Human Development Index (HDI), and, and um, so it's you don't you know you don't get any better than number one. So the thing is that basically um, the Nirvana fallacy um, or some kind of anarchist criticism of power was used and is employed by these um, U.S.-backed NGOs. Um, so it's shocking when these people get to places in, in the rest of the world and they realize that there's also laws and there's also, you know, bureaucracies and expectations and, and prices and things but, like but that. But Joaquin, I think um, I've heard you say in interviews with uh, Morris that there's another angle. That the, these problems are created. The tactic is to try to harm the societies and then you have the NGOs attack the bad things that you yourself created. Right? Yeah, so, so basically there you was... You demand so. that, let's say, well, let me give an example. Let's say a, a, a country like Syria has a free bread program or something for the poor. And then, you know, to join some international agreement or foreign trade thing or whatever, you have to get rid of that or to get a foreign loan or whatever it is that you need to do. And so then, of course, the poor are angry. Right. For 40 years, right. they've been getting subsidized bread and now they don't. Right. I right. think this is what happened in uh, Egypt, as near as I can figure. But and then you have a charity, a Muslim charity that's run by the Saudis or the Turks or the CIA. And it gives the subsidized or cheap bread. But along with it comes lessons in hating the government. <laughs> right. Right. OK. OK. So basically what happened is. Um, in the 2007 um, United States housing market crash, and then they introduced QE1, um, and then people remember that the money went to the banks and went to the stock market and didn't go to homeowners to bail out the homeowners. Okay, what was done at that time was a <clears throat> a market manipulation scam, where uh, U.S. firms cornered the global market. Um, of firms that that traded primarily with the Middle East in perishable goods, so this would be like grains, rice, corn, things like that. And so what they did is, once having cornered the market, they then enforced a monopoly-based spike in the cost of bread. So pre prior existing uh, costs that had been normalized through some element of of competition and other market mechanisms were then voided and a higher price was introduced, then governments had to introduce um, some type of subsidy. But even then, instead of the price being 10 times higher, it was only four times higher. But it still went from a loaf of bread being 30 cents for a full-size loaf 
to, to, you know, to being like $3 or something or, 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 or 80 cents or something for a loaf, which was enough to, to, to piss people off, right? The other element, and to speak to the other part of that, was yes, in fact, so you had, say, a better, a good example is Egypt, um, one I'm a little more familiar with in terms of the details with Syria, where there, there was a, um, a mixed economy, of course, um, in, in Syria and under the Ba'ath Party. Ideologically, it's socialism, but they weren't like, it wasn't, it was more like a mixed economy. I mean, they had a social democratic economy, if that makes any sense. And so what, so what ultimately happened, though, is that, right, in, in, the, in the wake of the, um, basically, when the U.S. went into Iraq, um, uh, so Assad was, 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 was part of the countries of the Arab League that were like, well, we're against the, you know, overt use of force, but, you know, there were countries like Iran and Syria uh, and others which, you know, sort of helped to manage the occupation uh, or consented to it and, and did things which, uh, which sort of um, dealing with the reality, not that they were U.S. allies, but they thought that they could survive it and then also kind of advance their own angle. And in this process, the, um, you know, uh, Syria has had a long relationship with Iran. Um, the Syrian um, occupation of Lebanon uh, and its relationship to Hezbollah um, and Hezbollah being a national liberation movement in uh, in, in, Le in Lebanon, which um, has a very nuanced, uh, a very nuanced approach to the history of the Syrian occupation of Lebanon which the, uh, that occupation was an occupation against Israel. So it wasn't just, it wasn't, this, this was not a Lebanon-Syria issue at the start. So what ha happened is that there were um, radicals and there were people who are generally anti-imperialist and there were people both secular and Muslim, um, both Sunni and Shia, um, who were against um, the war in Iraq and against the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and they saw people like Assad um, as being compli complicit. So the thing is that we can kind of look back and see, aha, well, they're, you know, they're, they're doing a color revolution Arab Spring tactic against Assad and, and so on and so forth. But to radicals, both secular and religious on the ground, that have been following the story for a long time, you know, Assad was, they saw Assad as being complicit in, in the U.S. maneuvers. And so there was a whole other... Uh, conspiracy theory in the Middle East that Iran is allied to Israel and that Israel is also working with Syria and that ISIS is a legitimate real thing and they're just kind of like the no bullshit crew that's going to go against everything. So that and that is explains some of the real appeal of some of this stuff. The secular end was more represented by the FSA in Syria and there were like pseudo Trotskyist and social democratic groups, very small, um, but whose voices were magnified by the U.S. State Department and some American Trotskyist and British Trotskyist groups um, that tried to give a left wing tinge to the FSA as and Assad being a you know a bourgeois dictator, a Bonapartist, a, some sort of you know a human human rights abuser. So they appealed to this kind of soft left human rights. By and adding some kind of fake Marxist analysis to back it up, and so you know these were real things that Assad had done, and and then of course and then to address the final part of what you raised, the economic component separately and aside from the cornering of the of the grain markets, there was generally a push to liberalize these economies. There was generally you know uh, this had been a process going on for over 25 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this had a major impact on the non-aligned movement and non-aligned movement countries like uh, like Syria and Iraq and Iran and Libya and so forth um, and and Yugoslavia. And so once the Soviet Union was gone, actually we've seen basically a war. The U.S. has not been able to attack Russia much further. They broke off Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland from the Warsaw Pact, um, but integral Russia has been remained intact. And and in the 90s and in the last 15 years since the beginning of this millennium, the primary war has been on the non-aligned movement countries. So in the, the broader context, yes, you know, these are, you know, less so with Gaddafi, um, but with, with uh, 
you know, Mubarak, I mean, he wasn't some anti-imperialist, uh, you know, figurehead. I mean, this is a guy who was legitimately hated by many layers of Egyptian society. And then those who kind of clung on to, to Mubarak in some ways um, uh, were just either that psychological group of people that have authoritarian personality complex or those who are a little bit more ideological were trying to look for some glimmer of Nasser in him. And, and I think a lot of people see that a little bit more in Sisi. But Mubarak was completely complicit in the, in the um, cutting off the Palestinians and closing the tunnels whenever they'd emerge. And, uh, and you know, Mubarak uh, was, uh, although a, an American ally and, and close to the British, um, he was against the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a very, very complex story. I mean, you to get into the details of these things. I mean, this is like Lawrence of Arabia stuff, and there's an enigma wrapped in a riddle inside of a mystery and so forth. I mean, but to, uh, to untangle the web of accusations and conspiracy theories involving, you know, basically emerging out of the Ottoman Empire from 100 years ago in the post-Ottoman order and how the British and French imperialists worked and created uh, religious and secret societies and or built off ones that already existed and, and, and how Wahhabism came to be in Saudi Arabia is this whole other subject. But we can say um, to you know, kind of clarify things and without mystifying, without adding layers of confusion, we can say that Mubarak was, was hated by many people for good reasons, right? And so ultimately, um, people who were involved in overthrowing him even though it was the larger context was a was a destabil regional destabilization, and with the aims of of getting someone like Morsi to back Turkey's uh, intervention into Syria, um, you know, it uh, uh, the people had legitimate reasons. Now, I think in Syria uh, a little bit less so, and I mean you can almost gauge how these things went down by the level of support that that they had. For example, there was there was no military uh, intervention required to overthrow Morsi. Just the kind of, there, there were, of course, radical groups. There was a lot of assassinations and kidnappings and stuff. There was violence, but it, there wasn't, you know, U U.S. bombs. There was no no fly zone call for Egypt. There was none of that, right? Libya, uh, the U.S. had the bomb. Gaddafi was the most popular. Um, more, uh, and Mubarak was the least popular. And Assad is like somewhere in between. Right. And actually, sure. it went down that way. The reason we don't have Gaddafi now is, is, you know, in fact, the people supported Gaddafi in Libya far more than originally Assad was supported. In fact, the course of the war has brought more people over to Assad's side um, just because of the of the insanity of these of these ISIS and Al Qaeda death squads and, and their fanaticism. But um, had they practiced some degree of purity of arms, they probably could have won over the hearts and minds of Syrians in all, in all honesty and all reality. Had the U.S. funded it right and had it been um, involved more secular forces or sort of a split, a split in the Ba'ath Party like they've tried to reintroduce into Iraq with the so-called Nakashbandi, the so-called Sufi Sunnis um, in Iraq, if they had done that originally, uh, a, a sort of Ba'athist Sunni alliance in, in, in Syria that was secular and practiced some degree of purity of arms instead of decapitations, kidnappings, and Sharia, they would have gained a lot of ground. In Libya, over there in North Africa, of course, the U.S. had to bomb them. I mean, Gaddafi was massively supported, and the Syracinian, Cyr you know, uh, revolt was being really, really pushed back. The TNC, the Transitional National Council, was thoroughly rolled back. Popular forces, the, the, the official military in in Libya was organized very much like a guerrilla army and it was it was and it relied a lot on sort of same uh, theories of guerrilla warfare and and popular support and it was a party organization so you basically had like block captains and popular organizations that were built like into the parent teacher organizations like the PTO and student groups and firefighters and people like that and and everyone in the community knew where the guns were located so that they got attacked they had popular militias, and everyone underwent everyone underwent some degree of arms training. So, you know, there was a it was a popular counter revolt that was pro Qaddafi um, that really rolled back the 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 Wahhabists, and and so you know, I mean, that, that just trying to paint a picture of how these things went down in the Middle East, the refugee crisis. Now we we can say with a high degree of certainty that. Um, while not predominant numerically, um, an, an unjustifiable number of the of the people 
um, who are refugees are in fact um, ISIS or FSA commanders, recruiters, and and fighters that got that saved their beans so, and got paid well. So Joaquin, Experts. so what does it all mean then? What is the game plan behind those who want to send ISIS to southeastern Europe? Well, plans change. You know, plans change. Uh, it's it's not a one. It's not a unidirectional thing. They they kind of um, the the Western Alliance. Um, face a lot of setbacks. Things didn't go as they planned. Um, you know, it's one of the main things, you know, we had always said from the start and that I've written about that the conflict in Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East is are, are two theaters of the same global conflict. Okay. And so if, if one of the aims of Ukraine was actually the U.S. or whatever, the city of London, Wall Street, the Zionists, whatever, right? Okay. To destabilize uh, Europe by putting it into conflict with Russia, and to the extent that, in a sort of half-assed way, and and not not completely effectively, but while still maintaining some semblance of sanity, the Europeans have managed to avoid being drawn into a conflict uh, with with Russia. And as we said in your last on part one of the show in the last episode that for the time being, things in the Donbass have quieted down a little bit, so they're not quite as nuts. So, but the U.S. still needs Europe to self-explode, and they want Europe to explode onto Russia. It's kind of like uh, the 1930s and the Great Depression, and then they want to make you know, Russia the enemy and then have some explosion of Europe onto Russia and, and the attempt to destroy Russia and and Europe at the same time, leaving, you know, the the unscathed victors as 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 so. Um, so that's that's actually a connection here is that so you know planning in real time contingency plans, Plan B, Plan C, and so forth. Okay, let's bring, um, let's make a humanitarian crisis. So it's got a number of different angles. One is of course just the normal chatter. Okay, there's refugees and blame Assad. Okay, there's refugees. Um, therefore, bomb Syria. There's refugees. Let's blame Russia for um, not allowing the the ISIS to win, which creates more ISIS. Is actually their argument. And um, so, uh, but on another level, of course, it is about bringing in people into Europe that are going to keep causing. It's as part of the strategy of tension. Um, where and you you mix groups that don't like to mix, right? You, and you force them into into desegregation scenarios, or you ghettoize some population, and they don't assimilate. And either way, you've got a recipe for tension. You've got edit, there's added little benefits too, like the tendency for wages to be suppressed because it's there's the market of of labor is changed in favor of the employer over the employees. So you've got union busting. Uh, and you've got, uh, you know, depreciation of wages and so forth, inflation of currency, and, and uh, a humanitarian crisis, which then also makes things more desperate for Europe as their public coffers are strained. This creates divisions among the ruling class because it, then the talk becomes about how much can we increase taxes or how much will the ruling class have to pay more to offset the cost in the, within the context of sanctions on Russia, which have harmed Europe more than Russia. So these are this is how I have it, you know, the whole game figured out. So it is connected to destabilization, in fact. Well, how would you argue then from the point of view of those who wanted to basically destroy Europe and Russia? How is the game going from their point of view? I mean, um, not as well as they'd like, you know, not as well as they'd like. We just had, you know, it's um, uh, the the Russians are, of course, the ones um, backed by the Chinese who are like the silent, you know, silent partners with an even bigger stick. Right. They're, you know, they just, China doesn't even say anything. They just do things. And, and Russia says a little and they do a little bit more. And the Americans are the big talkers and the little doers. And what what's happening is that the is that you have with Russians are, you know, people have been pushing on them for like 10 years. Like, come on, do something, get more active. And people have been kind of daydreaming around the world about Putin doing something big since like 2004, 2005. 
And, um, you know, the Russians are slow to, to be propelled into action. They say the Slavic culture, the Slavic mentality is they can take a lot, but once they hit the breaking point, then they're in it to win it. And one of the things that's happening now is um, people thought that Russia should have been denouncing things that the U.S. was doing for a lot longer or calling it out. And what we've seen in the last two years was kind of a little bit of talk about international law being violated and then a little bit of hinting about questions about 9-11, which were aimed at American audiences. And then more increasingly in the last like six months, Lavrov has been saying all kinds of things that are really paradigm shifting in terms of international relations. People who understand the um, Geneva and the, basically the state of affairs and the, um, that, that describe both the end of the USSR and the end of World War II as two major events from which um, new agreements have been made, um, Oslo, Rome, uh, and so on. And in international relations, these are major. And so the fact that, that Lavrov had been pointing out that the U.S. is, you know, violating these basically, you know, was, is kind of major. Then last night on American television, um, you know, Vladimir Putin speaks to Charlie Rose on 60 Minutes. And uh, he says, um, he says it in the form of a question, but he's making a rhetorical point um, uh, that the U.S. Uh, is... Uh, is occupying Western Europe has with intercontinental ballistic missiles, and um, and turned its occupation force into NATO and branded it NATO, and so you know now it's now that he's basically saying he's massaged it and he said it kind of bluntly, but he still massaged it as a question uh, that the U.S. is occupying Europe, um, militarily occupying Europe, and this is a big this is a big big thing. Um, they uh, are the ones that uh, are, are frustrating U.S. plans overtly the most and the Chinese, you know, uh, covertly, so, but, but still playing a more and more pronounced role visibly. So, you know, that's what, that's what the Atlanticists or the Western Alliance is thinking. Um, so they are trying to reconfigure plans. And you see things kind of go a little bit out of sync um, and you can you can catch the script get out of sync because they plan because if like if uh, if uh, if you're gonna fake falling down when I hit you um, but I fake hitting you and then you fall down but I haven't hit you yet then like the viewers can see something's really very very fake and what happened with Syria and the refugee crisis is Russia talked about getting heavily involved with, and they they leaked it through alternative media manipulating the information war and then all of the like historically pro-Russian bloggers that have been right about other things, then all of a sudden like said, okay, yeah, Russia's moving in, they're going in big now, and they didn't go in, and then the refugee crisis was triggered, and they were, you know, you can see now that they had planned to blame the refugee crisis on Russian military activity that didn't happen, and then it was out of sync, and then the military activity was kind of slowly warm, warmed up in an announcement, slowly over time, several weeks after the refugee crisis hit its, its apex in, in the news cycle. So it's very, very, very funny almost how that works out. Um, but you can see that those are the, how the U.S. had gamed it. Hmm. Yeah, certainly you could see the info war on that particular topic. It was pretty important. But um, uh, before we move on from Syria, do you think that basically Russia is now going to uh, how can I put it? Make the Syrian coast theirs? They're going to make that's... it Syria's, you know, and I think that's the most important thing is, um, you know, it, uh, they, are, they, they, they will be um, the most visible actor uh, moving forward, but you, they will still have the Lebanese Hezbollah, you still have Iranian special forces. You still have a Syrian Arab army. The Syrian Arab army still has the manpower to make a difference. Now, with with more intel, better training, better equipment, um, you know, the Russians made it very, very clear to the Israelis that Israel cannot hit any targets that the Russians are at, and the Russians may move, and that means that there's going to be less places that Israel can play with. 
and um, and Netanyahu went home fuming from that meeting, and um, then to pushed on the APAC to you know get Congress to act, and so uh, you know Obama now spoke with Putin, and we're going to be reading very very soon about what was said at the UN after the UN meeting. So, do you have any um, thoughts on this uh, UN situation? We have. You know what? I <laughs> all pretty yeah. much there at the same time, and it yeah, yeah, trying to catch the headlines. I thought um, the the popular uh, the popular uh, commentator and, and writer Pepe Escobar um, was pretty on point, very funny, talking about you know uh, Francis who the real superstars are are uh, are the Chinese premier and um, and and Putin. And I think, yeah, it was a, uh, a sort of a ruse. I mean, it was this, this focus on, on the Pope. I mean, come on, the real show is, uh, is China and Russia right now. And, um, you know, trying to take some of the, out of the stuff out of their sails. But it, it's not going to work. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's, the center, it's the center attraction. It's the main event. And, and what's really happening, what, it's so symbolic. Um, so all of this has happened. And... Putin speaking at the UN. Um, I haven't watched it at all. I've been I've been working on another project today. I imagine, and I'm probably you know if I'm wrong, you'll already know. But I imagine that some that the U.S. staged like Micronesia and to, to to walk out and American Samoa and to walk out when Putin spoke. I don't know. Um, Samantha Powers, you know, walked out. I imagine or or should have if they if how they've acted before. Uh, is it all is it all pertinent, or maybe not? But um, you know they definitely were not happy because this is symbolic, of of you know this is sort of like Putin. It's like what it's like short of a coronation in front of the eyes of the international community. It's like it's kind of like uh, it's like uh, when a girl turns 15 or 16, she has a debutante ball. This is like Putin coming out as uh, you know Russia being the the leader and the voice of the free world, right? Um, this was a big event and. You know, make no mistake, the United States wanted everything to go wrong prior to this day because it was announced over a month and a half ago that this would be happening. And the U.S. wanted everything to be a different story. And they just don't know. They didn't know how to act. They don't know how to how to wing it. The refugee crisis was their best their best game that they could play. And it looks like waters rolled off the back. It's very hard to pin the refugee crisis on Russia, especially the way they mistimed, uh, the way that they, they misappraised Russia's activity and the timing of it. Uh, now we remember very clearly that Russia got involved after the refugee crisis as a response to it. And they actually did an end run around the U.S. who was going to be the ones to respond to Russia causing the refugee crisis. So it was quite brilliant on the information war side. And really the U.N. event is kind of like the final, you know, I don't know, F.U., you know, is the yeah. final. Yeah, it, just, it, it all leaves a very strange feeling. I mean, we have this rare situation with the moon and, you know, the Shemita talk and all this other kind of stuff. And then... You have all these leaders showing up at the same time, and they say Putin is like only there briefly, doesn't even want to spend the night because, you know, how can you arrange a hotel that won't be bugged or something right. in New York? Are there any hotels that aren't bugged in New York? Right, yeah, it's not like <laughs> I mean, even the, even the Motel 6 is bugged, isn't it? <laughs> right, right, um, right. Well, I mean, it's, it's – Well, I tell you what like, – well, do you know what? Just conclusively on the security issue, it just made me think, and it's for what it's worth, is that you know security is a very big issue, and every every person that Putin meets, um, they have to be very careful about even interacting with human beings um, when he goes uh, into a Western country where it's easy to have different agents because of where they have the, what the, the nature of oncoviruses is and how they have figured out how to combine different viruses together so you can meet one person that has one part of it the next person has another and so on and if you contract um, all separate parts of the virus is not an illness but as the viruses are programmed to recombinate you can meet four or five different people and then you can get some you know super aids 
Well, that's a nice thought. Um, yeah. Well, the next uh, topic I wanted to get into is back in your neck of the woods in the in the Balkans or southeastern Europe. Where do you see things now, not just in Serbia? I mean, what what's happened in Greece, for example? Uh, Tsipras just got reelected, and he seems to be, I don't know, is he working for Goldman Sachs or what? What what do you what do you make of what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, so far as it's keeping Greece in the EU, it's connected to Goldman Sachs. You know, um, I, I wrote about this subject a lot, and I've been trying. I've been I'm, in my role. I've tried um, to add clarity to the subject, and I, I'm, you know, um, I, I'm sympathetic to all kinds of different political movements, or I can analyze them objectively, and I can I can see where the hopes are and you know, I think that on the economic side of things, you know, a lot of people hope that the Euroskeptics um, would would prevail and the Euroskeptic wing would prevail. And there's a lot of fantasies about Greece exiting the EU. I never saw that as a viability or as a probability. Um, and I wrote about how it's actually, um, you know, one has to back up and think about and people got confused about the role of Russia and Greece and the EU and Greece and the idea of a Grexit. And uh, Russia is not against the EU. Um, they, they just want the NATO and Wall Street occupation of EU to end. And, and uh, so that might be very different EU, but, but all these components still fit together. And, um, and Russia saw Greece... Um, as as something uh, like what Ukraine um, could have been, um, or as what Hungary um, has tried to position, or what Serbia can be, um, which is a point, which is an EU country, which is also pro-Russian and are the critical embryonic points of of uh, bilateral trade that brings both the Eurasian sphere and European spheres closer together. And so um, Russia did not have a problem um, uh, with, with uh, Greece staying in the EU, and they supported that, and they just wanted to try to help uh, Greece be involved in and I'm not saying in some, uh, you know, uh, rose-colored glasses way, but they wanted to be involved in Greece to invest in Greece, and they wanted to be um, part. They wanted to be a guarantor um, of Greece, and they wanted to use that. They wanted to buy their way into Greece, if I can put it that way. And they thought maybe they could, you know, do something about sanctions, or they could warm ties between. Europe and Russia, and they could do, you know, work against the trends that were developing around Ukraine, and use Greece as a as an anti example of bringing Europe and Russia together. So it was the idea that um, there would still be austerity. That was a separate issue too, you know, the austerity. And people are confused. How did Cyprus win the, you know, the flat the the, the flash election? Um, how did he survive the 180 after the referendum? You know, how did all these happen is because people don't understand um, mass politics, and that's normal. There's not a lot of education. But um, having come out of not only mass politics, but left-wing politics, but moreover trade union politics, I can tell you that, you know, really there's a bunch of coalitions and alliances. And um, even though people on the left might think in terms of, like, the working class, it's really more accurate, while that's a, while that's a workable sociologic category to work from. Um, there's also vertical divisions in society. You have firefighters and nurses. You have school teachers and police. You have construction workers and you have engineers. You have electricians and you have plumbers. And you can organize society vertically, not just horizontally. And so what Cyprus did is they he basically got some trade unions to agree that they're going to gang up, you know, four trade unions to gang up on the fifth. So they made Everyone had to come together and agree on some austerity all around, but some industries suffered more than others. But that one industry isn't going to be the, the launching point of the revolution against Cyprus. So, yeah, you can, you can do austerity that way as long as you make the important constituent groups within the, the organized part of the working class um, on board with it. You can do it. That's why, that's why Cyprus was part of making it necessary because... Pasok would have never been able 
to get the trade unions on board with austerity. You need these these um, Euro communist types to lead austerity because it's all about the organization of the vertical industries. But that wasn't had anything to do with Russia and Grexit. So there was like three distinct issues that really people confused. I think that the course that Greece is on was the most predictable one that they are going to accept austerity, but they're going to mitigate it in some way. They're going to remain in the EU and um, they're surfing it right now and they might get a haircut. And um, as we think, see things developing in Syria and in Ukraine, and as you see calls from, from France and from Germany and from many businesses to end the sanctions and, you know, with Iran kind of getting temporarily, maybe only welcome back into the, to the you know, countries that are recognized by the West as existing, uh, you know, you might see something happen uh, more with Greece and Chinese capital or Russian capital in Greece. So, you know, that, that, is, that one well, might be more stable than, than the central Balkans and north of, of Greece. Well, Joaquin, I guess my um, concern or disappointment, though, is I think that part of what's been needed is kind of some good role models or not just people, but I mean political parties or countries, right, that we can look at and say, let's try to, you know, use that for our purposes or something. And I look at Cyprus and Syriza and Greece, and I actually don't really see it as particularly looking like a successful model, uh, you know, how this is all played out. Not, not trying to pick on any particular, you know, person or anything. It just, it, it could have been in something that inspired us as opposed to we look at it and say, well, I guess that's the way things go. And so that, that's kind of the disappointment, um, uh, you know, at least on my end, as I, I was just hoping that we could, you know, see not not like a, a left wing revolution, you know, but just something that you'd look at it and say, OK, some compromise that makes things less bad for the Greeks and, you know, so on. And um, anyway, so far, we haven't got that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's they're going to. Yeah, it's austerity is in effect. And I agree with you. It's you know, this is um, these are the times we live in. And and I would have liked to have seen it be something more inspirational. But, you know, it's not going to happen from electoral politics. It's just not. It's just not possible because electoral politics is all about is always about maintaining the status quo. And you might alter the form a little bit, but the content's all going to be there. So that's the you know, that's the nature of electoral politics. If it was going to be some kind of revolution and, uh, you know, you would have like um, popular armed popular committees and you would have you would have a, a just no confidence in the state apparatus at all. So um, if you ever see like an elected, um, you know, a European, um, you know, it's some variation of some type of Obama type plot, you know, um, I think <laughs> but I think, you know, <laughs> but you mean Greece, Brzezinski you know, or, or Soros or somebody. Yeah, you know, well, you've guys. got like Corbin, Corbin or something like that. And, you know, people get their hopes. I mean, how many times can they get trolled over and over again? You know, I mean, I'm not I'm not calling for people to stand up and get shot. I'm not calling for people to do things that aren't going to happen anyways. But um, if you don't have a revolutionary situation, then you don't. And um, Greece was not a revolutionary situation um, because the subjective factors are just as much a part as the objective factors. And to be and to be quite frank, um, Greece took a hit, and you can squeeze from the people, and it's been hard. But um, you know, Marx was wrong um, that 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 the uh, you know there's a direct connection between the. Um, economic austerity and popular uprisings. Um, Engels, for example, because we're talking about Greece and, you know, the communists and the socialists were a big part of it, and they read, they do their readings of Marx and Lenin and Engels and whatnot. And, um, you know, Engels and Marx also thought that it was times that the economy was expanding and doing very well that um, the, the trade unions grew the most and that the working class um, saw its potential more and that depressions actually... Um, had a disuniting effect. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true, um, but certainly the fact that things are bad, you know, people can take a lot and people, you know, lose their apartment and they move in with their parents and then they move in with their grandparents. And then you've got, you know, 10 people living in a 500 square foot 
apartment. People do that. Okay. People do that. And if the alternative is getting shot in the street, um, they will live 10 people to a 500 square foot apartment. They will do that. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, any other things that you want to cover in southeastern Europe? I mean, uh, the Albanian um, question, or so right. So I mean, the it really, you know, all roads right now lead to the refugee crisis, and Albania, um, Serbia, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Montenegro. All of these have just tremendous action right now. It's just not in headlines for you know people who are, because the headlines don't focus on these countries until it's too late. Um, or until it's just on fire completely. But, I mean, God, it is brewing. I mean, see, the thing is, is that um, the refugee crisis is particularly in, for the Balkans an attack on Serbia. Why, why? Because, first of all, the refugees are being, um, the ones that are re either being returned or haven't gone to leave are in the north of Serbia. That's an autonomous region that has a 6% Hungarian minority, which is relatively small, but you know, Novi Sad, which is the capital of this autonomous region, it's the second largest city in Serbia after Belgrade, um, has got about two million people, but about 250,000 of them are Hungarians. This is a Hungarian minority that's born in Serbia, but um, maybe half of them still speak Hungarian. It's Hungarian in German language schools. The Hungarians are particularly fond of the German language for reasons that people would know from the Austro Hungarian Empire. And um, something that's very strange is that the um, Muslim migrants and um, some uh, Yazidi too are being kept in the northern part, which is already has a separatist movement that NATO backs and uh, NGOs back. And um, and it's very strange to, to include um, this this in. in. So that that's a, another major major part of this. Um, that is the reason that Serbia is being targeted like this is not just for the things that they're doing, uh, which we've mentioned and talked about several times. And even on this show today, we've talked about um, so not going back there, but moving forward. The reason that Serbia is being attacked this way is because Serbia's strength. And I hate to say this is not politically correct, um, but is because they are a ethnically homogenous society. Right? Being Serbian is like a subculture. And subcultures are very, very strong, right? Because it's because everyone has in-group mentality. It's not a multicultural society. So Yugoslavia was kind of multicultural, even though there was a lot of things in common in in being a Yugoslavian. Um, the religious uh, and regionalism um, was promoted deeply by NATO and German intelligence. Even Noam Chomsky wrote quite well on this subject, surprisingly. And um, and these were exploited, so they're divided among Catholic, Muslim, and Orthodox Christian lines that we now see today as Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and then the two Serbias. And so in um, independent Serbia, which is the one that I'm in, um, it is being attacked, the, the homogenous um, mono, monoculture angle of it is being attacked. So they want to create more basis for there to be um, ethnic tensions. And so having a bunch of um, immigrant Muslims, you know, I mean, I know that's not, the, you know, their primary identity where they're from, but to Serbs, they are primarily Muslims. Like we just said, this is not the ancient history. This is not black and white grainy film footage. This is stuff that, um, you know, people your age and my age would have fought in that war. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that's, and that's what, that's what, is happening, and it was Muslims fighting Christians, and there was decapitations, and the Saudis were here, and they were funding the Bosniaks, and they already had Wahhabis. Wahhabis have already been here for the last 20 years, right? So, it's um. Well, well, Joaquin, I think we we know that uh, the story there is uh, is pretty uh, pretty brutal. So, um, if there's anything on that front you you want to uh, cover from the past, we can, but. Um, you know, I would just conclude on the subject of the Balkans by saying right now there's a small growing attempt to do an occupy in Montenegro. Montenegro was part of Serbia until 2007 when NATO went in and bribed a drug dealer to run for office and they split Montenegro off of Serbia. From a geostrategic position, that was a big defeat for Serbia and for Russia because that is Serbia's access to the Adriatic, and that is uh, could be is a historic warm water port 
for a Serbian navy, which no longer can exist without Montenegro. So then you have um, uh, in the issue of, of Bosnia coming apart. This is intensifying. They're gonna, they want to abolish the Constitution. That Constitution recognizes um, uh, dependent Serbia, with the Serbia that's trapped inside of, of Bosnia-Herzegovina. They want to remove their um, autonomy from, from there. They want to give autonomy, the NATO wants to give autonomy to 6% of Hungarians to control all of Vojvodina as a minority rule over Serbians in the Vojvodina uh, province of North Serbia. In the south of Serbia, they want to do the Kosovo project again in another region called Sanjak, where they've got Albanians and Bosniaks um, uniting to break away Sanjak province of Serbia. And um, in the Macedonia thing, we just saw just last spring at the, at the beginning of the summer, there was still still petering out and a whole attempt to overthrow the government of Macedonia, primarily over energy markets, primarily over Turkish stream and and the fact that they were not uh, sufficiently anti-Russian. And so, of course, the government, like all governments are corrupt and, you know, elections are rigged and there's wiretapping and cronyism, nepotism. Uh, yeah, we live on planet Earth, you know, human beings, we're all sinners, whatever. That's how it works, at least in this present age, in this present, in, in this gestalt, in this paradigm, you know, that, that's the, the, the viewpoint of, of politics. And, uh, and that's how anything gets done. So, but the fact that those were real grievances, again, they were exploited by Western-backed NGOs to, to do this Occupy thing, that failed, uh, and then we see the refugee crisis piggybacking on top of that. So that is going to come undone because uh, Bulgaria uh, government is firmly pro-NATO, pro-EU, but more dangerously pro-US on the EU side of things, and they are an Atlanticist hub right now. That government is doing everything anti-Bulgarian in Bulgaria, anti-Serbian and anti-Russian and anti-Macedonian. And they mobilized one third of their military right over to the Macedonian border, prepared for an invasion in the event that there was a power vacuum. For people who don't know, um, half of Macedonia is considered Bulgaria by Bulgarian um, irredentists and chauvinists. So um, they deny also the Macedonian identity and they say that Macedonians are all Bulgarians. Uh, and so, and the other third or 25% of Macedonians today are ethnic Albanians who've been let into the country following uh, several reforms, uh, a major one in 2010. There was another big thing that happened and it gave Albanians, you know, basically just an unreasonable amount of autonomous control. They control the border with Albania. And so Albania is really the like, is like the Israel of the Balkans in terms of it just being this spoiled brat baby that's given billions of dollars a year to, you know, grow their military completely disproportionately from their GDP or from their capacity to project power otherwise. And Albania, um, 80 percent of their population is under 30. And uh, and they've all just been raised, brainwashed on pro-American propaganda. On NATO. NATO. And they love it. So... Uh, that's the that's the deal with Albania is you know one of the main main catalysts for all this stuff to go sideways very very quickly. Well, Joaquin, I kind of hate to uh, wrap it up so uh, quickly there on the, when we're just getting into the Albanian question, but maybe we can cover that in a later show because it's so important. Um, uh, any uh, any last thoughts there for uh, for our listeners on uh, this mess that's exploding there? You know, I, I think we've thrown a lot at the listeners, and it is there's just a lot happening. And what I just encourage people to do is, you know, start reading articles about um, the Balkans, uh, those countries we talked about, and do it online. And because all of your online searches are monitored and optimized for your uh, viewing pleasure, because you're being spied on yourself, you'll start seeing... Um, way more. If you start looking at articles about Albania and Serbia and stuff, um, then they'll start popping up as recommendations in your in your own news feeds. So, <laughs> so you know, but pay attention. And, and and even though it's got you know normal Western narrative in there, often um, you'll get some gems, and and you, you'll at least you know know that things are heating up. 
Oh, for sure. And uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, upside of um, Skynet uh, paying attention to us or something. They they love us. They they want to help us get better searches and everything. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks for your time this uh, this week, uh, Joaquin. And uh, looking forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, Great. take care, thanks folks. For having me. See you. Okay, it's a wrap. Bye.